Good morning and welcome everyone to this session of the SJSUSLIS Colloquium Series. I'm Dr. Bill Fisher and I'm happy to welcome everybody here today and welcome our speaker, Cheryl Stenstrom, who will be talking to us today about uh, her dissertation research and you can see the uh, topic of her dissertation uh, on the screen in front of you dealing with funding decisions uh, for public libraries in Canada and um, we're happy to have Cheryl with us uh, today. Uh, Cheryl has an extensive background in public libraries uh, in Canada. She's a graduate of the MLIS program at the University of British Columbia, uh, worked in a, a number of public libraries in Canada. Um, most recently, she was the chief librarian of the South Shores Public Libraries in Nova Scotia. Uh, she's now back on the west coast of Canada where she does some consulting and also teaches in our program here at San Jose State as well as the uh, program at the University of Alberta. So let me turn things over to Cheryl at this point. Thanks, Bill. That was a nice introduction. I appreciate it. And um, thank you for inviting me to do this presentation for the SLIS Colloquia series. Um, I'm really uh, excited to be sharing this research that I've done and uh, it's nice to be able to do it in this format. So um, as Bill mentioned, my topic is around uh, the decisions for funding for public libraries and it's certainly a topic um, near and dear to my heart. Um, as he said, I have a background working in public libraries in various areas including uh, leading public libraries um, and consulting. So. I'm going to be talking about specifically the um, decisions that uh, affect the funding for public libraries with a particular emphasis on the role interpersonal influence can have on those making the decisions. Um, as you saw from the title slide, the setting for my talk is provincial or um, in the American context state level government, um, though my study was focused on Canada, but it gives you a sense of that being that secondary level of government um, that I looked at in my study and I'll go into more detail detail about that setting in just a minute or two. Um, as you heard, the talk is based on my recently completed doctoral dissertation and I'll be speaking for about a half an hour. Um, so let me jump right into my introduction. In the last uh, several years particularly, um, say five or, or ten, uh, we've heard a lot of uh, pleas from the library community to stop cutting the funding to, to public libraries, various um, stakeholders in that community. We've heard it a lot in the popular media, um, examples of difficulties for uh, budget difficulties have come from all, many corners of the world um, and they include the US, the UK and definitely here in Canada as well. A recent report from the Library Journal's uh, annual budget survey noted that the overall trend in uh, 2010, the fiscal year 2010, was a brutal grasping by money-starved government officials for the low-hanging fruit of library budgets. 72% of survey respondents said their budget had been cut and 43% had staff cuts. So that gives us an idea of the landscape of how uh, library budgets have been affected. In the UK, um, over 450 libraries there have been under threat. Citizens have held a Save Our Libraries Day of Action there and um, for any Canadians who are listening, most recently we've heard about uh, the case in Toronto where the city of Toronto was looking to cut that library's budget by 10% overall. So despite these reports though, uh, very few research studies have looked at public library funding and none of them have explored these interpersonal factors of influence around the uh, budget making decisions. So by way of background um, and previous studies, we know um, that there's little been um, studied about public libraries in a political setting generally. Uh, typically in the past, um, research has focused on uh, the perception of elected politicians uh, and the, the, their perception of the role of the public library as it compares to the perceptions held by professional librarians. 
And just seven studies, in fact, have examined the factors influencing funding for libraries generally. They're, these studies were um, very broad in scope, and they looked at the role of the public library director, um, the library board, and the role that library patrons can have on the budget process, as well as external factors like um, the socioeconomic uh, basis of a community or even a country. So what we know from these studies is that there appears to be no correlation between public demand for library services and increased funding. Um, and this is probably quite relevant to us in recent uh, years where we've seen an economic downturn and increased use, uh, and yet we're not seeing those increased budgets um, in that context. Other really uh, very highly intrinsic factors like the actions and preferences of individual decision makers can control the outcome of the funding process. Um, and we'll see that again in my study today too. Uh, and um, external factors again like the socioeconomic and educational levels of the community may have a correlation to higher budget levels overall. Here in Canada, um, uh, we have um, a uh, prolific researcher, Diane Mittermeier, who's looked at the role of the public library board as a body and um, looking at what influence the, the library board can have on elected officials. Um, and she certainly has noted that there are benefits to having a library board, but uh, raising the profile of the library with the public has been off-cited, but um, persuading city administration and budget matters has not been um, a widely recognized role for the library board. And then finally, um, when we look at what we know in the literature of public libraries around advocacy, um, campaigns carried out with a goal of affecting decisions about funding um, have really been uh, not had much impact uh, without the development of strong relationships with uh, local politicians. So we've seen this in a study done uh, by McClure, Feldman, and Ryan who looked at that local uh, municipal setting. Um, and we'll certainly see how this is reflected in uh, my findings as well. So no prior studies uh, have been undertaken that specifically examine the construct of influence in decision making for funding about Canadian public libraries at any level of government. And the specific question I was looking to answer in my study was um, what are the factors, uh, what factors of uh, what are the factors influencing decision-making priorities during the budget process in Canadian provincial governments? So let me just talk for a minute about the theoretical framework of influence that I used for my, my analysis. Um, Robert Cialdini is an American social psychologist who's empirically tested the factors that influence um, people to make decisions the way they do. It's a very simple framework um, with six elements. Um, his framework is universal in that it looks at influence from uh, downward, upward, and lateral views. So we can look at subordinate relationships and um, uh, power as well in this framework. So as I said, he's refined it to just six factors um, noted here where authority can be uh, hierarchical or organizational power, or it can also be authority of expertise. So those who are perceived to have genuine knowledge or the reputation of having um, genuine knowledge on a topic may be able to make more persuasive ar arguments in that perception that they're more authoritative. Consistency and commitment relate to a target's need to um, carry through on um, previous statements or promises they've made or actions that appear to be uh, consistent with their values, statements, and uh, public beliefs. Uh, liking reflects both the popular definition of the term, so that, you know, the mutual affinity between two people, but it also encompasses aspects of the mere exposure theory, and that's the notion that um, somebody might find an object or a person more attractive as they become more familiar with it. Reciprocity reflects exchange theory and supports the idea that targets are more willing to comply with requests if an agent has a, had a prior exchange with them. And those um, prior exchanges can be things like favors or gifts or advice giving. And surprisingly, uh, Cialdini asserts that an agent might be more successful in influencing a target even if the favor um, was received by the agent rather than given by him. So it's a little bit counterintuitive that way. Uh, it works sort of in both directions. Scarcity refers to the lack of availability of an object or, or um, service or the perceived possibility of that lack of availability. 
pardon me, availability. So an everyday example includes the retail sales pitch of buy now, they won't last at this price. Um, in the context of this study, services that might be seen as uh, valuable and hard to obtain are seen to be scarce. And then finally, social proof is um, the reflection of a decision maker to act in accordance with their peers or um, in a way that's socially acceptable to their peers or others. So it, just to quickly, it's important to note that I've used um, provincial financial support as a measurement of increased or decreased or neutral support. So I specifically was looking at the funding support that these governments were giving public libraries in Canada. And after looking at budgets uh, for about the past decade across the country, I noted that there was a large increase in funding allocated to libraries in the uh, province of Alberta, to public libraries, pardon me, in the fiscal year 2009-10. In the same year, a decrease in funding for public libraries um, was seen in British Columbia, that's our most westerly province, um, and in Ontario, um, our largest province, there's been no change, in fact, for several years. So we have three examples of um, support in, in those three provinces, increase, decrease, and neutral. Um, I collected data for my case in three ways, uh, from primary and secondary, secondary documents, um, and from a series of uh, 18 interviews that I carried out between January and November 2011. I also uh, did a pilot study prior to the main study in 2010 in another province. So just quickly, um, I used NVivo software to do content analysis of the interviews um, and I used two cycles of coding with two rounds uh, each and you can see in, uh, from my slide it included provisional coding, hypothesis testing and elaborative coding. And now I'm going to move into the main part of my presentation of the case findings with an overview of the most um, salient events that took place in each jurisdiction and then move into a discussion of each of the six tactics of influence um, that I just described from Robert Cialdini um, across all jurisdictions and then I'll wrap up with a few uh, concluding remarks. So just broadly speaking, um, the provinces in the study have uh, definitely experienced greater financial stability than most other parts of the country. Um, their, their political arena is marked by significant differences in each area, so voters in Alberta and Ontario historically have um, leaned a little more to the right, fiscally conservative and right of centre governments, and it would be difficult to characterize uh, British Columbia's preferences since voting historically has been very erratic. It leans strongly toward one party, followed my majorities for the opposition parties. Recent uh, years have shown very similar tendencies in Ontario as well, with three different major political parties enjoying majority governments in recent decades. So while that strong economic footing of each province might um, provide some expected similarities in fiscal attitudes and decision making, these varying political biases would probably suggest differences as well. So when we look at um, Alberta, the case there for uh, substantially increased funding in that 2009-10 year uh, fiscal year began easily more than a decade before the money was forwarded. There was a highly sympathetic and politically astute um, elected official who was uh, able to secure sizable amounts of additional funds for specific purposes throughout her tenure as a representative responsible for public libraries. And then later in the mid-2000s when she was the chair of the Treasury Board, and that's the agency ultimately responsible for approving all provincial funds, um, she was also able to direct an exceptionally large quantity of one-time funding to libraries when a year-end surplus was discovered. Also around that time, um, the provincial office responsible for public libraries moves moved to a new department and another sympathetic uh, elected official inherited the library's file. His interest was um, motivated by his own positive experiences with the public library uh, system as a child. One of the senior bureaucrats there um, told this anecdote about him and said, you know, he came in one day to talk to the library system, we were meeting in a downtown hotel and he's this huge man and he walks and he sits down. He's got his farm clothes on and uh, he makes himself at home. He said to the group, I guess you want to know why I'm so interested in libraries. Well, a boy who don't speak English sits in a corner and nobody cares except the librarian. So between the public librarian and the school librarian, they taught him how to speak English. 
this elected official, official went on to review, uh, to do, lead a formal review of public libraries, um, which revealed a need for an additional $27 million in uh, funding annually. And that's an amount that would have more than tripled the existing provincial budget for the area. Uh, the stack, stock market crash in late 2008 led to financial constraints across the whole government in that jurisdiction, but despite this blow, uh, $9.3 million in additional funding for public libraries was endorsed by their uh, executive in the 2009-10 budget. So really realizing this 40% increase in funding for public libraries is likely due to several things. Um, the personal commitment of those involved in moving forward the cause of public libraries combined with their ability to recognize and act on opportunities as well as building on successes over many years has allowed this, the uh, library sector there to enjoy frequent funding increases that are not only substantial but higher than any other increases in the country in the past decade. So moving on to um, British Columbia, uh, the decision here to reduce provincial funding for public libraries um, was probably also due to several factors that result from a foundation formed over several years. Um, despite a marginally smaller impact from the global recession in 2008, um, this province, um, British Columbia, was not able to weather the financial difficulties as well as Alberta. Um, strong political leadership in the last decade um, and the response um, to these challenges was deep cuts and spending freezes across government and public libraries were no exception. So in many ways um, the provincial funding allocations in this province for uh, public libraries mimic, mimic its political and economic history and a roller coaster um, isn't an unfair metaphor. Um, there was a substantial increase to the uh, funding for public libraries in 2005-06 and then followed by this unprecedented decrease in 2009-10. At the time of this decrease, um, there was a move to centralize decision making in government and uh, more tightly control the um, bureaucracy which made it difficult for the library community to effectively forward their case through that bureaucracy. Um, though the personal commitment uh, to public libraries of the um, the Premier, which is equivalent to the state governor, may have tempered the final budget outcomes at this time. The um, individual influence of this particular Premier, uh, this leader at the time, w in all areas of government was unquestionable. Um, his personal values and experiences were highly visible in forming the basis of the party's platform in each of the three successful election campaigns he led. Uh, the, these initiatives were reflected in the values of the party and they, they were very much aligned with the work being carried out across government, but the case of libraries and literacy, literacy were undoubtedly two of his great passions. So it was his prompting to explore the uh, state of public libraries that led to this um, mid-decade substantial increase in funding. Um, around 2005-06 and then again arguably his influence helped conserve a portion of the annual allotment in that um, later budget year. There had been rumors in fact of a 100% decrease at the time so um, some feel that the 16% decrease was um, a success in that case. So more than um, the other two jurisdictions in this study, uh, the library community in Ontario has had a, a difficulty in advancing the message about their needs. Um, again, in this province, the bureaucratic structure has been very uh, centralized for many years um, and there's little access to program experts for um, public libraries there. Um, Despite the difficulty that the library communities had in forwarding their message through these bureaucratic channels, there has been some traction found with elected officials um, and the result has been irregular conditional grants being offered in the past several fiscal years. Um, however, the case has not been compelling enough to secure an increase to regular funding. It seems in Ontario there's a belief um, that regular operating grants should be returned to the levels that they were in the mid-1990s. This has been met with political resistance uh, based on the fact that those decreases were part of a previous government's plan. Uh, three requests have been made to restore the annual funding operating grants and repeated feedback has been given to them that this argument is in ineffective. One senior bureaucrat there noted um, 
that they're asking for more money and it's an interesting conversation because they're talking about wanting the 40% that the former government took away back and that's a non-starter. So when the response was, well, we don't care about that, it's political, right? We didn't do that. That was her quote. So she went on to um, describe the library's uh, difficulty in getting their message across and she said, um, I would describe them as passive-aggressive. They're either passive until they're ticked off and then it becomes aggressive. So they're either silently, busily doing good works out there, what I describe as motherhood work, or they get royally ticked off and then go way over here, which is aggression. And they don't usually speak up until the library is about to close down and then it's wah, wah, wah. You just want to, you know, you just want consistent champions of your cause. So that was her um, advice to those in Ontario. Okay, moving on quite quickly here, um, that very brief review sets the stage uh, for the context of a discussion around, um, of inter in, inter pardon me, interpersonal influence, particularly as it applies to Cialdini's six tactics. Uh, so in this study, um, it was concluded that when decision makers considered funding for public libraries, they most often used three distinct lenses. The consistency lens, which would suggest um, decision makers ask themselves, what are my values or what would my political party do? The authority lens, uh, and that they were asking themselves, what um, is somebody with hierarchical power telling me to do this? But most importantly, the liking lens, and um, they would be asking, how much do I like and how much do I know about the requester of these funds? In all jurisdictions, the question of authority was present in um, those interview participants' assessments of its importance in gaining support around the executive table for specific projects. However, um, it was noted that this was particularly important in British Columbia. As I mentioned earlier, the experiences and wishes of the elected leader during that past, past decade were often used to guide the work of those in the bureaucracy um, in preparing other business, case, business cases for budget as well. So in the case of public libraries, uh, this authority was key to the success of the mid-decade multi-year request for increased funding and as I noted, it was arguably his intervention that prevented additional decreases in the 2009-10 budget year as well. One uh, senior official there noted that um, the context is really important and there's an element of the leader's increased uh, interest in literacy. If he's making a lot of public noise about setting targets for improving the literacy of the province, it becomes very difficult to do anything negative to libraries. Literacy was his initiative, which is actually quite distinct from a government initiative. And another one um, took this a little far, farther and considered the political ramifications of, of using the leader's authority and said, we may have worked for the chief of staff, but the leader is focused on literacy, so we were focused on literacy. Somebody else, um, another interviewee there was uh, a little more direct in her description, um, but noted that, you know, the leader's goals were also the, the political party's goals. So that intersects with a tactic of consistent and com um, consistency and commitment, pardon me. So she was saying, having that leader's message right up front, it was a big deal. I can't stress that enough, that political well right up there at front, I mean, you don't mess with that. It fits really well with the great goals in the province. So again, in each jurisdiction that I looked at, um, tapping into either personal or organizational values proved to be very important for the library community in, in advancing their uh, causes. Again, here in British Columbia, um, those personal values of the leader were aligned with the work libraries pr were prepared to carry out. In Alberta, the importance of ensuring elected officials understood the congruency between their party's campaign goals and the work of the library was stressed repeatedly by senior government officials. Um, and as mentioned earlier in Ontario, the repeated reference by the library community to a previous government's action have not assisted them in uh, gaining support. So at the time of writing my dissertation, new party leaders had taken power in two provinces um, and senior bureaucrats noted uh, in both places that everybody's scrambling to align themselves with these new platforms to figure out what the new language is um, and to understand that there are key phrases and key activities in, in these departments. Uh, a senior bureaucrat noted, um, if your elected official was in charge of this or leaning in that direction, here's what you say, go and talk to them about these things. The libraries gradually got into that. So that was direct advice provided there. 
um, particularly for those with extensive experience in the government sector, learning the language and values of different parties in the, of their uh, respective leaders was an important part of their day-to-day -day work. Um, one interview participant stated very aptly that there's a different emphasis on the syllable, but there's not that many new ideas out. Government does what government does. So you position it differently, you brand it differently. And she uh, went on to talk about her experience um, with failing to align her work with different governments and said, um, we try to make the best policy decisions we can, and I don't mean to be disrespectful here because the political lens is equally important, but we're not in a position to apply that in the way elect elected officials can. So when a proposal gets back to them and they say, you guys crazy, we're not making this cut, this is a priority of government, go back and do it again, there's quite a bit of that. It's very difficult at every level to make those decisions about what's the right balance between the priorities of government and what the money's actually got to do. So um, far exceeding any other theme in the study, uh, the relationship building code uh, and its related tactic, influence tactic, liking, presented themselves as central to the work of those in the bureaucracy and elected officials. Um, whether this was for information gathering, information dissemination, or general networking. Um, this ability to talk up proposals informally increased uh, its chances of being accepted in all instances. Um, Long-term senior bureaucrats know their information gathering uh, uh, extended significantly to their informal and formal networks of colleagues, um, usually developed through the various positions that they'd held over the course of their careers. So here's um, an example from one of the provinces where a senior bureaucrat said, that was all based on personal relationships with people. When I first came here, I went out and talked to all the support people, all the budget people. I had a relationship with those people for 20 years. They had my back. When I shifted to libraries, it was no problem. They would see opportunities before I would in terms of the money and give me a heads up. Um, another senior official um, joined the effort to move a library initiative forward and felt that his significant network would be useful to the project. And he said, um, I knew a lot of people in the system. There were very few offices. I couldn't simply pick up the phone, call somebody and say, gee, what's going on? I didn't know much about libraries, but I did, did, need, I did know about the inner workings of government and how decisions would be made and how it would capture people's attention. I was busily picking up the phone, calling my contacts in education and health and Aboriginal relations, economic development, all of those places, talking about the importance of libraries to each of their files. And this um, sense of maintaining a strong network uh, extended through to the elected level as well. One official noted, um, a local union person came to see me about a potential partnership between our department and, uh, and the union on a Books for Babies initiative. So, you know, I kind of like that. He and I are old friends from a different battle. And again, I'm inclined to do the partnership with them. So again, um, especially for those with a lo long service within the bureaucracy, um, these strong networks and their ability to work among colleagues was really considered an essential part of their professional behavior. Reciprocity um, is a complex tactic. It encompasses uh, both commonplace activities like ensuring fun funders are thanked for their work or um, giving elected officials uh, the opportunity to be publicly recognized for their work as well. Um, and when requests for uh, funding were successful, libraries were favorably seen as a polite uh, partner. Some, one person said that, I think people are generally savvy, you know, so they're very good at making sure their elected representative knows that they appreciate the support from the province by sending letters and invitations to events. They're savvy. But at the lowest levels, uh, these thanking officials is certainly expected, but it's most noteworthy um, when the opportunity for recognition is missed. So uh, first of all, that gets noticed, um, but also it can certainly erode long-term relationships. So when asked about whether um, this kind of misstep was noted, um, one of the senior bureaucrats I spoke to said, yes, it sure is. And now there are no strings at all attached to the money we're giving them. All they have to do is provide us with a financial report annually. Many of them, it shocked me, they don't even honor a deadline. We have to chase them for that. There's a sense of entitlement for the money. No other sector I've worked with, um, they would be right there on the deadline. It re really shocked me that we had to chase them. Others, in fact, were um, less polite about expressing the same sentiment. Uh, 
referring to the fact that um, uh, when rumors of a decrease were uh, floating around in uh, this province that uh, it makes a difficult decision on the part of government easier because they're seen, the library um, community is seen as a bunch of whiners at that point. Uh, I have to make an explanatory note on the comment of scarcity. Um, so this tactic describes the high value of items, services, or organizations that aren't readily available. Um, the concept of this study was only noted in the negative or as a null tactic. So in other words, no decision makers uh, gave the impression they felt library services were unavailable or at risk of becoming unavailable. They um, didn't have the impression that public library set services were threatened to the point of closure, uh, nor did they express that decreases would result in the removal of indispensable services. Um, and, and again, this is in a Canadian context, so that might differ um, in various places. But when coding the data for this uh, Canadian study, the notion that libraries are marginal or that they lack prominence or not as highly valued was used as the basis to examine this tactic. Uh, several library uh, uh, pardon me, interview participants felt the library community had difficulty um, communicating their stories. So this was that lack of prominence. Um, Certainly, uh, the, this ability to create a compelling case was likely hampered by stereotypes about public libraries and public library trustees and senior staff. Um, within the uh, British Columbia government in particular, the word advocacy was a really a hot button that should be avoided. Um, and this was stated repeatedly across several interviews that um, uh, those interviewed, those senior bureaucrats and elected officials felt that the library community had lost ground by uh, approaching the issue as a heavy duty advocate. Uh, one senior official said that from her perspective that advocacy is a, it's a very loaded word. Uh, so many people have different perspectives on um, what they mean by advocacy and I, I have to tell you from where I sit, my red flags go up. If somebody describes themselves as an advocate, I hear special interest group, lobbyist, you know, somebody coming with cap in hand to try to embarrass their elected representative. That's what I hear. It doesn't do the community any favors by labeling themselves as advocates. Uh, and others, in fact, were more blunt in their description. Um, for, uh, on these perceived efforts to, of the library community to gain attention from decision makers with comments ranging from they were whiners, they were always crying and bitching, you're not doing yourself any favors because you're not telling your story, you're just whining and sniveling to I said do what you need to do, go write letters but not the whiny ones you usually do. So. Perhaps the comments that most objectively indicate the lack of urgency to increase funding allocations alluded to the local nature of the service. So uh, over 90% of the funding responsibility in these jurisdictions lays with the local municipalities, the local cities. So I think this tactic warrants an alternative analysis um, in a local jurisdictional setting rather than the secondary level of government. Um, Finally, we have social proof and um, I did find that bureaucrats in the two most westerly provinces consider each other's experiences when they're preparing background information, a little less so in Ontario, but um, most often the detail in these comparisons was minimal. So in no instances were specific, um, specific detailed statistics used to build a case. So the, despite this lack of prominence of um, social proof, that it was nonetheless um, prominent in the data that I was coding. So this really abbreviated review, a um, very quick look at the six tactic uh, reveals um, both the influence tactics of authority and consistency and commitment were readily apparent throughout the case in all three jurisdictions. Uh, a more thorough analysis exposes the process um, were that the processes that were highly successful were very highly dependent on the tactic of liking. So more than any other tactic, interview participants acknowledged the concept of relationship building that was present in their work um, when they were advancing requests within government, not whether pertaining to library funding or other non-library related issues. Stable personal networks were used to ensure proposals were both thorough, so that was um, that they had gathered critical information throughout from the people in these networks, but also um, that they were used to position their cases for acceptance. So often informal support was uh, sought in advance of formal voting processes. Um, and these networks are most often created over lengthy periods of time. 
So of lesser importance yet still present uh, were the tactics of reciprocity and social proof. Um, at the practical level, these activities um, related uh, to these tactics were mostly important insofar as that they pr provided support to those more dominant tactics of liking um, and consistency, commitment and authority. And then finally, um, the tactic of scarcity stands in contrast to the previous five. Uh, this concept of something being more valued, if there's a threat of its disappearance, but it was intentionally covered with the interview participants and clearly understood, but none felt that uh, this was a factor of influence in the decision-making process for library budgets. So a little further discussion um, about the tactics shows that there's a lot of complexity in the analysis. Um, the analysis could allow for the possibility of ranking the tactics in terms of their use, but it, I'm not convinced that such a ranking would reflect overall effectiveness. Uh, in, influence theory recognizes that um, the effectiveness of specific tactics is context uh, dependent. That's been um, well documented. And then, as I just noted, um, it was difficult to analyze the six tactics in, in a completely discrete way. So, in other words, the effectiveness of a tactic might depend on its intersection with another. So, um, I've developed a possible mo model of influence for public library funding uh, decisions at the provincial or state level, and that's shown here on the slide on your screen. And What's shown here is the importance of the liking concept while recognizing that the context may elevate the importance of the tactics of commitment and consistency as well as authority. So um, while many public libraries are facing uh, difficult decisions in the face of uncertain funding, um, the ability of our sector to obtain favorable responses to requests for increases might require a less simplistic approach than we've previously thought. Uh, creating those meaningful uh, connections with individuals in many communities across all levels of government is probably going to need to be emphasized as a key to success. So as Cialdini himself has declared when discussing uh, the most effective tactics for influence, the relationship is the message. So that concludes the uh, formal discussion that I'm presenting today. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, that was great. And I've, uh, of course, ha had uh, the pleasure of uh, tracking some of your, your research as it uh, went along. And uh, every time I, I hear you present on your study, um, I'm more and more impressed with uh, what you did and, and some of the conclusions that you've come to because I think they're all very important for the profession. And I mean, just in, in terms of what you presented today, thinking in terms of how for most of us we think in, uh, being an advocate for something is actually a good thing, but um, you can advocate and be a champion of something without necessarily using that term because I suspect, as, as you found out, many people will see that term in more of a negative light uh, than a positive light. So it, it, I think, also speaks to what you found out, and that is it's, it's really incumbent upon our library leaders to really know something about those individuals that have uh, any kind of decision-making uh, responsibility for how the organization, how the library is going to be funded and supported. Uh, so that would include both elected officials and, of course, those people are going to turn over from time to time, uh, but finding out information about those people may be easier because if uh, things in Canada are anything like the United States, elected officials are under such a, a microscope or magnifying glass that you know, you know what they had for breakfast uh, tomorrow, today, uh, because of the media coverage of, of these people. But you also need to know, I think, something about people that hold, in this country we would call them civil service type positions that interact with the elected officials and with with, let's say, the library officials and know something about their background, know if they too learned how to speak English 
uh, based on a public library, or if that's where they always went to do their homework after school, and, and just knowing some of those kinds of things about these individuals strengthens um, you know, what you have on the screen now strengthens that relationship that the library itself or specific individuals within the library would have with somebody, and those could certainly help the library um, down the road for funding related kinds of issues as well as other kinds of issues. Certainly, yeah, it certainly allows you to um, seize an opportunity when it's presented, um, the more that you know about those uh, structures in which those decisions are made. And, and I think, too, um, just to um, strengthen what you're saying, that, you know, the old saying that sort of all politics are local, I, I think certainly applies in this setting for a public library Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's great. Again, thank you. Uh, good luck with uh, getting the results of your work uh, distributed and, and hopefully having an impact on um, how public librarians, as well as all librarians, because everybody has uh, this kind of uh, environmental issue of the relationships they have with people outside the library to make the library more effective. And I hope uh, people learn from your research.